The Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 educators in Tennessee through our online video library. These videos are aligned with standards set by the Tennessee Department of Education. For more professional development videos, check out our website at cem.mtsu.edu. My name is Kevin Stacy, and I am the EL coordinator uh, for Clarksville Montgomery County Schools. This is my first year there. <clears throat> Some of you may have known me through, uh, I was the executive director of EL for Metro National Public Schools. I was in Metro from 2010 to this past year. And then I was in Williamson County from 2000 to 2010. <clears throat> and uh, before that I did some work overseas and um, so I've been in the field for a little bit. And I just want to tell you, um, perception is reality. And that's what we're going to talk about today in regards to, oh, yes, they can. But perception is reality. I'm really skinny. I really am. But you may not perceive it that way. <laughs> But I can tell myself that all day long. Uh, but perception is reality. And so how do we get to the mentality, oh, yes, they can, to I know they can. So as EL teachers and EL leaders and EL administrators and leaders in our schools, we're constantly talking about the rigor and the expectations and how can we get there. And we've got all of these gadgets and tools and cool things. And we've got programs. But the real work is the teacher and the student and the mom and dad at home. And how can we get that mentality of from us saying all the time, oh, yes, they can, oh, yes, they can, oh, yes, they can, oh, yes, they can, to I know they can. And how do we get to begin to work with that? So that's where I've been struggling over the past few years of how do we get that practice? How do we get to do the main thing that we actually got into teaching for? Uh, that what called us into this field? How do we experience that with our teachers? And the first thing when we're talking about complex text and complex strategies, that paradigm must change. And how do we change that? As we go through this, I'm sure we've heard I can't wait for him to participate in class. Or, I don't know his language, so I can't explain this to him. Or, we just started a blogging project, but since she doesn't know English, I've put her on this program instead. She's going to be on Imagine Learning while we do this. Or, we're going to do this with this student while this is going on in the classroom. And so, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, but today the choir, we're going to be advocates today of how that we change this paradigm shift. My student needs to be pulled out of class. You take him. Take him. I don't know what you do. Y'all are wonderful. <laughs> Y'all are just the most amazing teachers in the world. I love our EL teacher. They do everything for us. That's a problem. So when we look at this, we have to think, which box are we checking? Love them to failure. That means we do everything for the student. And we give them text, uh, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Remember the old days of EL when we did the M&Ms and counted with fractions and different things? And because at that point, curriculum and rigor was not the main, main goal. We were just trying to get them to speak English. Times have changed. Now we're really working toward academic language and how to get them functional in academic language and proficient there. And some of that things that we used to worry about, we hope takes place on the playground to a certain degree. Or 
did not get that in, in, my, in my program. Uh, so teachers sometimes will say, I, I didn't get this degree. I, I didn't get this class. Or then you have the teacher that does a lot, of, and the child really does well. We have some amazing <laughs> scores in Clarksville. And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, how? How did we get this? But it's, some of those teachers are like, you're going to do this. I don't know how we're going to get you there, but we're going to hope for the best. And sometimes the best happens. And the three bears, and this is what we want. Just right. Getting that level, that scaffolding just right. And so I want to talk about how that we can help with that paradigm shift. The first thing that we have to address in relationship to complex strategies is we have to address our belief system. Now, I know you're thinking, well, I know they can do it. I know. I'm not, I'm talking about around this. How are we going to address the belief system around your area? The first grade hall, the second grade hall, ninth grade uh, academic uh, or academies. How can we address that paradigm shift from our belief system that our practices actually reflect our belief system? And then what do we need to know in order to reflect achievement paradigm shift in our schools? How do we get that? Well, when I was looking for a a vision statement in the EL office in Metro, we were working and working, and, and we settled on a vision with this right here at that time. The social, the emotional, the cultural. Now, that's very, I stopped there. Because if we don't love our students, and our schools don't love our students, and our teachers don't love our students, they will never hear anything complex. Because if you don't speak to the heart, you'll never get to the mind. And as we look at that, if the social, emotional, or cultural are there, then we can really get to that linguistic and academic needs of that child. How do we do that? I have been working with this for a while, and it changes every year because I think of something to add to it. But I have four pillars here. These are my foundation in order to start thinking about strategy. The first foundation is standards. We have to to give our students complex tasks and complex text. And they need to be grade level, they need to be exposed to this language. I didn't say master, I said exposed. They have to be exposed. Then when we look at the academic discussion, how are we addressing the essential question around the theme? It's got to make sense to our students. This is in the PSYOP where comprehensible input begins to to take place. Comprehensible input is not just speaking slowly. or louder. (laughs) It's not just that. Comprehensible input means that it's packaged with meaning. It's packaged with contextual meaning. Building background knowledge is a piece of comprehensible input. Uh, How are we looking at, with academic discussions, that interactive piece? I love Kagan, been to a lot of their trainings, and actually a trained professional development trainer in Kagan. And it's great for that social emotional learning, but pair share is not going to get it all the time. It's got to be interactive, back and forth, back and forth. How are you? How's the weather? I mean, what's your favorite animal, dog? Oh, mine's a cat. That's not interactive. Can you elaborate on this idea? That's interactive. What, can you please clarify? Can you please say that again? That we begin to have academic conversations. Fluency, building that background, and feeling accomplishment with our students. Our students need to feel accomplishment. So when I'm talking about complex strategies in just a few minutes, we also have to have fluency built in with that complex text because they're going to shut down. They've got to feel accomplishment within that lesson. SEL awareness, 
cultural response of teaching, knowing that our students are an asset to our buildings. We have heard, oh my goodness, I've got this many EL students, my scores, my TVAS scores are gonna plummet. But we need to be hearing, I've got a student from, oh my gosh, Saudi Arabia, we're gonna be able to do this, their families are gonna come to the classroom. They are assets. So as we begin to look at this and plan around this, we begin to move in. What is the content that we're going to teach? And what thinking are we going to be doing with that content? Are we synthesizing, comparing, contrasting? How are we going to be doing this thinking in relationship to the content, the science, the cells, to um, the thematic essential question of an ELA unit? How do we do that? And then moving into the academic language. While that content and that thinking are constantly working together, then we look at the academic language and reading and writing. Because remember, we've already got the speaking, the interactive piece. How do we move that into the reading and writing? How do we get that academic language to surface from the standard? I always try to visualize sometimes with my teachers. I said, think of a standard that is, is a, a water type of, uh, you're going to put the standard in water. Whatever floats to the top, think of it as the language that is necessary for that standard to be able to swim. Now, put the language under the heaviness of the, 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 the thinking, and now what's going to happen? That thinking is going to start floating, right? Does that make sense? Go ahead. Say that one more time. <laughs> so let's just put the standard in water and it's just sinking, right? It's sinking because it's, it's difficult, it's heavy, it's complex, it's too much. Our kids are having, I mean, they're like whoosh with the standard. Um, and then our teachers and sometimes our EO teachers are trying to get one project done with the relief. <sighs> Got that one done from that history project or that science project. And then we have to take a quick air for breath again, because here comes another project or task that we're having. And they're not learning language. They're learning perseverance. Let's just get her done. Get it done. But they're not getting language and learning and literacy at that point. How can we start addressing the standard is we take that language, that academic language, we separate that from the standard. We break that apart. It says analyze. Okay, what is analyze? Let's break that analyze apart. It says to compare and contrast. What's the difference between compare and contrast? I didn't know that until I got to college myself. Um, in Mississippi, everything was, we just compare everything. Contrast? I thought that was paint. Um, then when we look at that, we take that language apart and we put them and make them floaters. And then we put that underneath the heaviness of that standard, the thinking piece, that processing piece. And all of a sudden, the standard begins to float. It begins to swim. This is evident when we run through the lesson. And we get to the thinking, oh, good, we're here. And the students are like, <laughs> <laughs> and you're all excited, but somehow it didn't, wasn't contagious. And you go to the teacher's lounge that day and say, I tell you what, those students, or you hear those students, I spent one week. And now we're doing this paper, <laughs> this project, this multimedia paper project with Excel and PowerPoint and everything else thrown in it. And it's just, I don't know. I just don't know. I just, I'm scared about my scores. It's amazing when you get that language and build on that language 
with complex text and grade level task that when you get to the project, you begin to run because you floated the standard in the water. They can swim. All right, as we move in, that would be the task at hand is how that we look at complexity. If you take any of these out, what happens? If you take standards out, everybody wants to come to that class. <laughs> That's the Thanksgiving class, the Christmas class, the Halloween class. That's the theme class. That's those lessons that we never get rid of. And I'm not going to change. That's that class. If we take fluency out, you have frustration. It's too much. Because that fluency is that where they become swimmers. They like, I'm getting this language. We all know if you've learned another language, there are times when you think, I can't speak this language at all. I lived in Uzbekistan. There were days I went to the market and I thought, I think I just studied like seven months and I don't, still don't know anything. And then one day I'm like, oh my goodness, I got this. Our students need that I got this. They need those experiences. And if you take SEL out, you have nothing. Because if you don't speak to the heart, this will never sink in. That's, cra that's crashing, that's Stephen crashing. Low effect, the filter. And then it's amazing how we're still, we're, we go back to those things that we've heard a long time ago and the emphasis, but because they're key. So one of the things that I'm going to talk to you now is how do we do this? How do we get in? How do we get this done? So we talked about the paradigm. We've talked about all the different things, the necessary things. Um, so what we have started doing in Clarksville is we are taking the ELA scope and sequence, grade level task, and the first thing that I did when I got there was I had non-negotiables. ELs need grade level task, ELs need grade level text, ELs need integrated language, ELs need to be uh, um, uh, seen as assets in our building, and academic conversations needs to be a strong force within this. So once we began to have these foundational talks, the work began, how do we, how do we get this done? And as you're well aware, our transitional students, when they hit transitional status, now it's really important about those English scores, right? 10 ready becomes really important. So, how do we get the language of math, the language of science, the language of history? And that can be very deceiving to a gen ed teacher. I do the language of a lot every day. They're not getting to the depth. They're not going deep. How do we do that? In relationship to make sure our students are ready to meet the academic requirements of the ELA class to to get to their senior year and graduate and go to college or whatever they want to do. How do we get them there? So we began to look at the beginning, uh, the ELA scope and sequence and the ELD lesson plan and how do they merge as a part of the complex strategy. So the first thing that we address, the beginning drive, we say the beginning drive because there's two things. One, we got to build the drive within this lesson, and also the beginning drive, there's two ways to look at it. When you take a drive, you got to get your map together, and you know if you have kids, you got to build their excitement, or you got to tone it down, one or the other, it depends on where you're going. Uh, if you're going to a museum, you might have to build it up a little bit. If you're going to Disney World, no worries. Um, what background knowledge? are we going to introduce to our students? Now this is, background knowledge is something that we have to be very careful about. There is an art to background knowledge. The art is don't give away the answer. Don't ruin it for them. 
Give them what they need to know in order to be successful on the journey, but don't spoil the journey. So think of this as, I've got this great trip planned for my, my children. I'm not going to tell them until we get there, but I need to prepare them in certain ways by the essential question, making sure that we got the beginning drive. And of course, the language. What language is needed in order to do this? How do we do this? And then the theme sentence. <laughs> the theme sentence is our way of saying the juicy sentence. Everybody heard of juicy sentences? Oh. Oh, that's where I'm going to nail down today. Achieve the core just sent out a big um, um, guidance on juicy sentence. Where I'm getting this, these elements is this. Lily Wong Fillmore, who's a researcher from Berkeley, she is the godmother of the Council of Great City Schools for EL, English learners. So these are, uh, Nashville's a part of the Council of Great City Schools. Any district with a certain number, you pay to be in it, but it connects you to Los Angeles, Ball, I mean, all of the major urban cities in the United States. The Council of Great City Schools issued a pilot about four years ago that I joined. And the join was uh, one of the key strategies that we'll talk about today is the juicy sentence. But how do we get language learning and literacy? How do we combine it together? So Lily Wong Fillmore uh, worked with Marianne Kukatari, which is in the Northeast. And she just wrote recently uh, on language and learning with Learning Forward that I just passed out. And this is online. All you got to do is Google uh, um, language of learning, Learning Forward. It's there. You can come up. It's for everybody to use. So it's very easy to get. She outlines within this the strategies that are important in order for this to happen. So as we look at the theme sentence, the theme sentence or the juicy sentence, think of a juicy pear. You know, you get that pear, it smells good, and you bite and it just starts running down your cheeks. It gets on your shirt. It's just so much to that pear that you begin to salivate even before you eat the pear. And then when you're eating it, it's much better than what you even thought it was gonna be, that juicy pear. There's a reason why they have juicy pear fruit and they call it juicy pear. Well, think of this as that sentence that's got all of this juice in it. It's got complex uh, phrases. It's got transitional phrases. It's got figurative language in it. It is so difficult. It's crazy. So when we begin to look at this theme sentence, we have one, so we have uh, three, we have two texts for the EO class that mirror what they're doing in ELA. One text is super complex, the other text is the middle exile level, and then we choose a fluency piece that's guided. All right? But what we're going to bear down is we choose out of the complex, out of the two texts, we choose one sentence that does not give away the answer but addresses the essential question. And we put that sentence, and we just tear that sentence apart for three weeks. It's five-minute activity. So we take the juicy sentence, we put it on the board, and we begin to talk about it like, what's the subject of the sentence? What is the subject doing? Oh, cool. Great. Okay, let's go on. Moving on. All right, so let's, uh, today, next day, where is the, okay, so we talked about this, we talked about the subject of the sentence, what are some phrases that are describing, not words, because we've handled the words already with our vocabulary. What are the phrases that are describing possibly the sentence? Because we said this is a juicy sentence. This is not Mary walked the dog kind of sentence. This is a juicy sentence. What phrases are describing this subject? And then the next day, what are the phrases that's describing the verb? And we highlight these phrases. We just talk about it. And then one day I give out calculator tape. 
and the students write the sentence on the calculator tape. Okay, I want you now to tear up the sentence uh, by phrases, not by words. There cannot be single words unless there's an and that's joining two sentences together, a but or or, or whatever. <coughs> The students, and we did this in summer school, the students are getting up and they're having discussions around that language, that complex text, when they say to. The, you know, uh, the, let's just think of uh, the, juicy, the, the juicy sentence um, authored by um, the world-renowned Lily Wong Fillmore, who was a professor at Berkeley, now is uh, the emeritus of the Council of Great Seas Schools. That's kind of a juicy sentence off the top of my head. We're gonna break that sentence up because one of the things that we're missing with complexity for English learners is we go from word to text too quick. And we've missed the phrase. And this is the beauty. This is where syntax comes in. This is how you get syntax into that lesson. Because if we want our students to write like authors, they've got to have the structure. This really hit home to me this year when I was in stats. I'm getting my, finishing my doctorate, hopefully in October. And... I looked at that, I mean, talk about complex. It was way over my head. I was sitting there going, I'll, I'll never get this doctorate if I've got to do stats. And then she said, the beautiful phrases of Dr. Birch. I don't need you to make this stuff up. I need you to write these sentence stems in your explanation of these stats. This is not something nobody makes these words. You don't go in and just do your own sentences. We have a set formula for you to write these formulas down to, to explain the degrees of freedom and da 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 that you need for your research. Oh, hallelujah. I took those sentence stems and I just was writing a lot of way. I mean, I look like a doctor from one day to the next. And I thought, wow, because I needed help. I needed those structures. And it was expected to use those structures. So this is this. I'm going to play you a video now of a class who has been using, this is a kindergarten class, English learners, different levels, but I want you to hear the vocabulary they're using and see how they've been looking at the juicy sentence. This is one of the key, key ways, key strategies of looking at a juicy sentence. Continue our study of the metamorphosis of the butterfly. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All right, boys and girls, now I'm going to tell you probably something you learned about butterflies. I saw your pockets. So let's let's share them together, okay? Okay. Butterflies pump their wings. Butterflies pump their wings. Do you know why? That's so so their wings could dry. So they could dry. Good. Milani. Butterflies have long proboscis. What's proboscis for? Tongue, tongue, so they could drink nectar. That's right, mm -hmm. I use long proboscis to drink the nectar, just like a nectar. straw. Very good. Very good. Lots of hands. Good bow. Uh, and then Brian, bow. But if I drink the nectar from the flower, then, then, 
the Christmas not coming out. Then the one is coming out <gasps> now. I do a mountain. Do a good Andrew. Okay, so yes. you have a lot of information there saying a lot of things. You started by saying they get they get nectar they get from the flower, right? Then there's a chrysalis and something happens inside of that chrysalis, right? We're gonna look at the sentence like we looked at yesterday for just a minute. And look at your sentences. Then look at the big sentence. And it happens that it happens that this lady, Irene Kelly, who wrote this book, it's a butterfly's life, which is great. She was excited too about butterflies, so she wrote a book. And this is her sentence that we looked at yesterday. So let's look at her sentence and yours. Look at the next part. And wait, wait, wait. And now we get a chance to get it, okay? We're going to get to the class. Let's get it. The most awe-inspiring event in a butterfly. So that's one day, and then before. You can see how they built on this sentence and over time. But isn't that amazing that a kindergarten is saying proboscis? I didn't even know what that was until I looked at this tape. And the cr chrysalis. And, but did you see how it just naturally came out? There was no prompt there. It just naturally flowed. Because the paradigm has shifted. I think today, if I can tell you the biggest strategy... It is, you got them. You are strategic kings and queens. Y'all can strategize. You can, we, we know how to strategize peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I've heard them in, in, in the EO seminars of directions. Remember those sessions that we would hear? We know strategies. But the biggest strategic strategy I can tell you today is not about a strategy, which this is one strategy, the Juicy Senate strategy, Go look that. I have one hour, so you'll have to do some research on your own. Look up, achieve the core, juicy sentence, and it will give you full guidance on it. Okay, it just came out last week. But it's not that. It is the way of thinking. These teachers are not operating under, I don't know if they can do this. These teachers are operating under, they can do it. And for those that can't, I'll scaffold. I'll scaffold until they can. And so, and I think that's the key word today is scaffolding. <coughs> scaffolding, scaffolding. But not scaffolding from the basement up, but scaffolding what? From the ceiling down. Because if you always scaffold from the basement up, you'll never get to unit three. <laughs> of anything. I'm just using that as an expression. But if you start scaffolding down, you're going to move. And you're going to, and those kids, and then you, and one of the key things then in your, in your tool chest is how do you survive that child that's struggling? Then RTI square becomes a reality. And, and helping our English learners, because then you begin to see then, all right, is it language? Or is it not? And looking at the thinking processes and then comparing apples to apples, peers to peers, Spanish speakers to Spanish speakers, coming at the same time, same country, as we begin to look at those different types of uh, ways of examining. But you've been giving them a lot of great input. And as we look at that conversations, you see all that academic conversation going on with those students. That was not, what's your favorite animal? Or what's your favorite food today? It was about the background knowledge, building on that background knowledge. So no time was wasted in this lesson. I'm going to go back because of time. But I think you get the idea. If you Google butterfly juicy sentence, it'll come up. Um, and so... And one of the things, they identify the ideas packed into the sentence. They have moved from now, they've done the word level already. So they've handled the word level. 
And by the way, let me kind of give you some ideas about the word level that you'll find in your packet. Uh, they call it wordplay. Shades of meaning is a great way to do wordplay. Okay? So, for example, one of the strategies I help with my teachers is this. I can't get all the vocabulary in. I mean, this text is so complex. All right. Remember, expose, and remember, read aloud. <laughs> the teacher should be doing a lot of lifting during this, right? When it's fluency time, who's doing the lifting? The students. But when it is complex text time, which a lot of it is complex text, you give them excerpts out of the complex text to do close reading so that they can begin to practice that juicy sentence work. Uh, but exposure is the key. I sat with some teachers actually yesterday, you know, two days ago, and they were, they were putting every vocabulary. I was like, There's no, you're going to have the three years to do all this vocabulary, much less 30 minutes. But how do you get a lot done? Well, you, the teacher takes the heavy words and then you do shades of meaning. Go to Lowe's, get those paint strips. You know what I'm talking about? Do shades of meaning. What is furious? What's a little bit lower than furious? Angry. What's a little bit lower than angry? Mad. Put that paint strip on the, on the wall. You got your words. So now we're looking on synonyms. So shades of meaning. So this group, I want you to act out these words. You got five words. This group, I want you to draw them. This group... Uh, <clears throat> I want you to describe the word. You're going to be, des you're going to be describers, you're going to be writers, I mean uh, drawers, you're going to be actors, you've got five words. I'm going to be going around helping them with this vocabulary, make sure they're on target, using bilingual dictionaries, using tools, using resources, but I'm also going to make sure that they're not doing things out of context in relationship to the lesson. Then we're going to have like a, a vocabulary fun contextualized after I've talked about the essential question that they see how this vocabulary begins to shape the meaning. Then I move into phrases with a sentence. All right, now, this is Achieve the Core, and I'll go ahead and click on that so that you can see it. Juicy Sentence Guidance, right here. I actually presented in front of Lily Wong, who actually brought this to, to being. Uh, she would absolutely say, do not get into all the little it's in bits and pieces of that. It's about kids talking about meaning of phrases and words. The guidance gets a little bit into clauses and to noun phrases, and you know, it gets a little bit too grammar-y sometimes. And the, the guidance from Lily Wong Fillmore, and I feel 100% sure that she would agree with me on this, and I've done a couple of times in front of her, is that it is more about the practice and the usage of language with complex text. But you can kind of get some guidance from there. So then when you're looking at how and when, we talked about that in regards to the read aloud, moving into where the teacher really begins to ask key questions related to the essential question and the text that you're reading and, and really looking at that. And making sure that we're providing academic conversations. I'm gonna show you another great uh, uh, complex text strategy Academic conversations. Have you heard of academic conversations? Have you heard of Jeff Spears? You're going to love me if you have not heard of him. I love this man. I have a bromance with this guy. <laughs> JeffSpears.org. He is a Stanford professor. He is on it. Wrote academic conversations. He's got several books out there. You want some tools to give to your, your content teachers on how to get your kids talking in the class? Because we know they don't talk unless they're in your class. Exactly. Ah. How do we get them to do that? Well, number one, another strategy that I want to talk about today is that needs to begin the paradigm shift of complex strategies is you've got to also really note student strategies. Student strategy is how do you get in that classroom in math and start talking, Juan? I need you to start, I need you to practice conversations in here because it's not just for here, it's for out there. And that's really key for our students to hear that and not think that they assume that. Because they're coming to your class and they think, this is what is expected of us. And then they go to the other class and this is what's expected of us. 
They've got to hear it from you. No, what I'm teaching you here is not just expected in this hour. It is expected in the next hour, and in the next hour, and in the next hour. You've got to try. And that's where that SEL is really important because they will not try if they don't feel comfortable in the classroom. And that's why I say our kids will not do what they need to do until the SEL is addressed. So working with those teachers to make sure that it is an environment for this that we're about to do, you're going to see really happens. And okay, here we go. So he's got all of these tools, the research, the tools, there's a book, but he has these posters and these placemats. So you build up the idea as much as possible. You are now, this is the essential question. This is the theme. These are the key questions that you have just talked about in that read aloud. You have built it up. Now, because this is so complex, right? These are juicy. They've got to talk about it. <clears throat> you've done vocabulary. You've gone to phrases. You've had the juicy sentence. But now they've got all this input. It's got to come out. And it's too soon for writing. I mean, you say writing dissertation, and I, I can find a million things to do. <laughs> Clean the house, even. <laughs> you want to do your, no, I don't want to write a dissertation. I'd rather go bathe a dog. <laughs> Students feel the same way. They are just little, they're just little people of us. <clears throat> we didn't change that much. <laughs> Build up the ideas as much as possible. This is the beginning of the drive, building that motivation, that frame motivation. And then we're going to talk about how do sell. You're going to read this text. They've got the text. You've already read it. And then you have that question. Looking at the text, how do communities come together? That's the question. Student one, I want you, so you can do, uh, what is your idea claim? Here's your prompt starters. Here's your response to clarify. Here's the support. Support to text, support to other text, support to the world, support to self. And you have all these prompts. You Google conversation, uh, academic conversation placemats and go to the Google images and you'll see all kinds of what teachers have done with that. To for kindergarten to 12th grade. And a lot of times, those, some of those placemats you put in front in front of the, oh, it's fine, but you put it in front of the student and then they roll one, two, three, four, and then they have to use one of the conversations on elaborate. But you see what we're doing? You're elaborating, you're expanding, you're comparing contrast. There's nothing easy about this. You're giving them, but you're scaffolding. You've got the prompt and you've got the, what? <clears throat> the response. They just start it and then they fill it out. You're going to have to model this. But once this gets going and rocking and rolling, oh, you can have some fun. That's when you've got to, so the first nine weeks we're doing this, right? Juicy sentence. Oh, my goodness. I don't know what he was talking about with that strategy. They're crazy. They can't handle this. Academic conversations, the first nine weeks. No, John, get back. No, no, no. You're not, no, listen to him first. Then, yes, it's like, let's play ball. You know, go back and forth. Be nice. You can't say he's wrong like that. <clears throat> and when you get out of the book, there's all kinds of things. Like it does talk about like uh, social awareness in the book, like knees to knees, eyes to eyes, be polite, be nice. There's certain things that they talks about. Um, but once you get to the second nine weeks, you begin to roll. Come January, you're going to hate that a test came because it's interrupting your good work. And come May, you're actually going to be disappointed. Because all of that community that you've built, all of that great work and that talk with complex text and that thought and that process, it's come to an end with that class. So this is amazing. And then let me show you another resource. Uh, why, uh, so here you go, comprehension target, literature theme organizer, narrative structure maps, cause and effect diagram. He's got so much. Go and have fun on his site. So as we begin to look at academic conversations, clarifying, justifying, we talked about that. 
Then we get to the writing task. I'm a thinking map person. I love thinking maps. We do thinking maps. But if you don't have thinking maps, it's okay. You can Google it and find out some ideas about thinking maps. Thinking map is uh, a system of, uh, I think, six or eight maps that really you can do almost any type of thinking with and you just add on instead of doing the fish bone and all that. But if you like fish bone, that's okay. I like good catfish every once in a while myself. So if you want to do that, the key though is visualizing our thinking. So we've had graphic organizers back to essential question, academic conversations back to essential question. Now we're ready to write, okay? We've got all this stuff around the wall for the unit. We've talked about it. And we've really worked well with, with the scenario. Now, within the unit two, we have, they go on to actively learn or whatever program you have to find that easy text. We do allow, and I don't know if Lil, I even said that to one of the uh, people that work with Lily. I said, I don't think she'd be happy with me on this one, but I, I feel this strongly about it. Um, that's where they are in charge of that text themselves, that easy text, where they can read at their own level. And they begin to build on some of the ideas and become an author of that text to aid to the complex text. Does that make sense? They just feel a little bit of accomplishment in that part. And that's when we brag on their, but we go deep with thinking, go deep with what the meaning is, and they're able to talk about it. And then what we really want to hear is that complex vocabulary coming into surface right now. And then we have the writing task and building that writing because they're talking about it and then helping them talk through the writing and building that out with a complex text. <clears throat> I'm going to show you a couple of tools that I have that uh, for my teachers that you're welcome to to help with that, okay? Um, also, I don't know about you guys, but I have stopped trying to make everything perfect and beautiful because when you do, you waste time because you never get anything out. Um, this is a unit of, for, to a, our scope and sequence. So I don't have everything there, but you can see how we've organized our lesson. So you'll see 10 ready narrative, narrative writing, writing language. On the back, you will see how that we've put, tied it to the ELA standards. And You'll also see informational literacy, save bail, media. We've got YouTube type stuff for building background information. The thinking map, we have the, the theme sentence in here. I've got example days of how I would do the theme sentence in regards, this is not perfect, but this is what I do with teachers one-on-one. -on -one. I bring them, this year I bring them in. We sit down, I did this just uh, two days ago with uh, three teachers. And I had one while I was sitting in there, hey, can we do this again on October 1st? Our principal said that we can uh, do our own PD, and I want to do this with you. This is, this is exciting to them, that they're getting to author this type of work. So as you walk out, here it is on the table uh, for that. I want to show you a couple of other things, and then I'll take questions. So this is our, uh, again, this is our, big, uh, this is our website that we have. And so curriculum resources... So this is, I have a PowerPoint here, ELA scope and sequence, how does this come together? And they have codes to get to the scope and sequence and different things like that. But below is an example of EL, ELA planning template. And so you can see right here, here's the big idea, the central question, the focus, the writing focus, and the ELD standards. Do you see that? Then I look right here, here's the assessment. How are they going to assess? Check the box. See that? The title, anchor text, what's your anchor text? Your read aloud and or shared reading, this is where, and then model best practices, turn and talk, establish mixed ability, turn and talk partners, or academic conversations, choose appropriate grade level mentor, text, scaffolding as needed, um, build or activate prior knowledge. These are just things to think through as you're doing this. Word study, picture support as needed, act it out, draw it, model teaching points with think alouds. And so we have... Title, lesson one, frame motivation or the beginning drive, the building background, thinking map, graphic organizer, I'm introducing my vocabulary here. Lesson two to three, I'm doing wordplay, academic conversations around new knowledge, 
uh, around the background knowledge. Introduce the theme sentence. Do you see how I've got this? Then moving on down the writer's workshop, making sure that they're bringing that word study into the writing, building that out. And then I also have them conferencing while they're writing. So they are conferencing back and forth with the students at that time while they're doing the writing and doing that modeled writing, guided writing, you know, making it very applicable for that. Uh, another thing too, this is my look boards that I, I help with principles. Grade level, yes, there's evidence that EOs are given opportunities to master the same ELA grade level standards as non-EO peers to the differentiating scaffolding. No, EOs are given overly simplified or watered down tasks. There's no scaffolding in it or it's not observed. So these are conversations. Yes, language objectives are clearly identified. New language is consistently developed in the context of content. Key vocabulary is continuously emphasized as we look at new language development. Academic conversations, complex text, background knowledge, balance of language skills, supplementary materials, and cultural responsive practices. So it's basically just a conversation as we look at that. And that is the, the, the accountability and the responsibility of bringing complex text to the surface. Your key strategies today, number one, strategic thinking. Uh, how do we build a culture in our schools? You are the drop in your school. You're the ripple. And it's not about you today. It's about the strategic thinking of how do we get our teachers in our schools to embrace our English learners, to get them to do the same things, and to help them on this journey. That our, so that we can change the sock, oh yes they can, to we got this, we're doing it, into practice. And so good luck. If you uh, need me for anything, please don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, any questions? I've got about five minutes. Do you have, do you have a resource or a go-to way of taking the kids or the students into the novel and finding a, finding a way to teach that? So when you're looking at a novel in a class, so one of the things that they're going to get in ELA is frustration, okay? Your class is not meant to be frustrated. Your class is to be right here. You see what I'm doing? It's right here, but I can get it. And, and that may look differently for different students, okay? So I may be... As we do this, Look at, that's where, when it's complex, you're going to take the juiciest pieces of that novel, okay? Where it's got the meaning. You may have to skip two and three and say, I'm going to summarize this for you. Or you may put it in writing and they take it to the next text. You see what I'm saying? You may summarize chapter two and three yourself. Then we get back to chapter three. Again, I'm going deep into the text. I'm going to read aloud and they're going to take out two paragraphs and we're going to go do a deep, close read. Okay? The key is not the whole book. I had a teacher two days ago that wanted to do the whole... I mean, she wanted to throw everything in the kitchen sink. And we're like, no, we can't do that with complex text with these, these students. Um, we've got to expose them and get them to mastery, but it's got to be scaffolded in a way. But we cannot sit down and give them no complex text. I'd say three-fourths complex text, one-fourth fluency. Does that make sense? Any other questions? I feel that strongly about it. I said three-fourths complex text, working with language, and one-fourth fluency. But now, th listen, w do what works. Yeah, 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 do what works. The goal here is to make sure that we put emphasis on the, the, the challenging aspect of grade level task and text without burning them out. Yeah. If they're going to burn out real quickly, you, if they're burning out in your class with being frustrated too much, you may need to take down the, the amount of complex text you're giving them, and you may need to up your up your read aloud, you know what I mean? Up your lifting, uh, but don't take it away. 
Any other questions? Wouldn't you also say that the amount of complex text would somewhat vary depending on the background, the student's background, and what their grade level and prior experience and what they want? Uh, I always say with the, so we have three complex text, I mean two complex texts. One is the upper level of the complex text, so this is like they're drowning, and the teacher is too a little bit. That, that day the teacher goes, I'm tired. All right? Then we have a, a, a complex text that's at grade level, but that Lexile level dropped a good bit. But it's still within that range. You see what I'm saying? So we're still finding good complex text, but it's not as high as this one. Um, because you know the grade levels, it's, it's a good span. And then that fluency is really at their reading level. Mm -hmm. Their reading level. Any other questions? Let's have a great year this year. 